unmute yourself. Am I audible now? Yes, you are audible now. Yes. Packet Independence Award Chairperson of Congenital Heart Disease Foundation Bangladesh, pioneer in the field of interventional pediatric cardiology in Bangladesh, Professor Brigadier General Nurna Fatima, Head of Pediatric Cardiology, CMA Saka, and Chief Pediatric Cardiologist, Navid Hospital, my mentor, mother of pediatric cardiology in Bangladesh. Respected Professor Muhammad Jahid Hussain, sir, Pro Vice Chancellor of Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Medical University and Chairperson, Department of Pediatric Cardiology, BSMU, as well. Distinguished participants, respected teacher from India, Assalamu alaikum and very good afternoon. I welcome you all to today's session. Distinguished participants, you all know that Congenital Heart Death Foundation Bangladesh is organizing weekend online lectures every Friday by eminent teachers from home and abroad on different topics of pediatric cardiology in joint collaboration with Narana Institute of Cardiac Science. COVID-19 is ravaging the world but at the same time, it has made the art a single global school of learning with the help of technology. We are more nearer than ever. This lecture series is a personal progressive initiative and result of relentless effort by my mentor, Brigadier General Nuna Fatima, to make us educated. At this point of time, I take the privilege to introduce and welcome today's respected speaker, a renowned professional in the field of non-invasive cardiology, Dr. Shotish Sigovin from India. Let me say a few words about him. He is the chief of non-invasive cardiology, both adult and pediatric, Narna Institute of Cardiac Sciences, Bangalore, India. Dr. Shotish has about three decades of clinical experience and vast expertise in non-invasive cardiology, which includes diagnostic and clinical cardiology. He is also a reputed clinical trainer, experienced teacher, and well-known faculty at various cardiology and imaging conferences in India and globe and other parts of the world. He was graduated from Bangalore University and did DNB from St. Joe's Medical College, Bangalore. Dr. Shutish completed PhD in ECHO at world famous prestigious KTH Karolinska Hospital, Stockholm, Sweden. His special interest is in echocardiography, which focuses on advanced echo, transesophageal echo, and structural heart interventions imaging. Dr. Shotish Govin co authored many chapters in cardiology textbooks. He has numerous journals published nationally and internationally. He is also a member of many prestigious society and body, including Indian Academy of Echocardiography, Cardiology Society of India, American Society of India, American Society, American society of Echocardiography, European Association of Cardiovascular Imaging. Today, suspected Speaker Dr. Shoti is the Vice President of Indian Academy of Echocardiography, former editor of in chief Journal of Indian Academy of Echocardiography and Cardiovascular Imaging. He also received an award for outstanding contribution for cardiology from AAPIO, American Association of Physicians of Indian Origin, in 2013, USA. Now I welcome our respected, distinguished speaker from Narana, Dr. Shoshi Govin, to present his topic on basics of echocardiography in pediatrics. Thank you for the 
kind words uh, i will first let me share my screen and then i will start off a very uh, good evening to all of you uh, first and foremost my appreciation and uh, congratulations to professor noor fatima on this wonderful academic initiative which i'm really happy to be associated with and greetings to my fellow panelists uh, dr ashfaq and professor hussein and hello to all the participants so today the topic is about uh, echocardiography uh, pediatric part of it which is probably one of the most challenging when it comes to echo uh, because of the complexities and the Uh, the difficulties that are encountered while doing pediatric echocardiography so my job is just to focus on the basics so i'll not go too much into the details of uh, pathologies just uh, a glimpse here and there as to how we should go about doing it when it comes to pediatric i think the most difficult part is to write a normal report so uh, we all have gone through this experience of uh, having a normal report and we are not very sure as to what exactly uh, we have uh, image so if we do it in a systematic way then our confidence level and our outcome is also going to be quite uh, correct so the first and foremost is when it comes to pediatric echo the uh, the the word that has to be kept in mind is the segmental approach so this is a time tested approach which has been there since almost 3 4 decades for 5 decades now and uh, this is just to make things very systematic and to make sure that the communication of the echocardiographer with the other members of the team is uh, correct in the you know it is it is conveyed in the right manner so what is this segmental approach so we have this uh, uh, two sentences the segmental and the connections so first let us look at segments so we have uh, three segments over there the atria ventricles and the great vessels the great arteries and then we have the connections so the three connections so these uh, six all together we have to analyze we have to image we have to go through in a very systematic way so when it comes to the connections uh, if you look at it here one can start with the veins so the veins uh connect to the atria so it is the veno atrial then you have the ventricles and then the uh valves over there so the atrioventricular and then you have the great arteries that is the ventricular arterial so in a very sort of broad way in a very simple way and but in a very precise and very sort of accurate way uh we have to approach our echocardiography based on this step wise uh, sort of in a very systematic way we have to approach it and this is the basis the foundation of a pediatric echo irrespective of how you approach it so just another look uh, at this uh, using a pictorial representation so you have the three segments here so you have the atrium so the left and the right atria is represented here and then there is the ventricular part the right and left ventricle and then you have the great vessels the pulmonary artery and then the uh, aorta here so in between you have the connections so the atria has to connect to the ventricle the ventricle has to connect to the great vessels so these are the connections and then you have the veins which come and connect the atria in terms of the pulmonary veins and then you have the ivc and the svc so when you are uh, approaching a patient uh, and you are going to go about doing pediatric echo uh, this sort of logic this sort of uh, systematic approach has to be there starting from the the veins going into the atria going into the connections here looking at the ventricles and then the uh, the connections into the uh, great arteries and then what is the relationship of the great arteries so there is this particular uh, classification system called as the van prag uh, classification system so it is again based on three important uh, components one is the visceral atrial situs so there is an alphabet for it and then you have the ventricular loop orientation so there is another alphabet for it 
and then the position and the relation of the great vessels. So that is the other alphabets. Altogether, we have three alphabets, and uh, this is a sequential analysis, and uh, uh, this is again uh, by the pioneers. Uh, Anderson as well as Von Prock, and uh, this has been combined. And over a period of time, this is uh, still sort of withstood time, and still very much the approach as to how we go about looking at it. So let us look at the first alphabet here. So when we are looking at the situs, so let us say that we have S for solitus here. So the solitus is uh, the way it should be, the normal uh, position, the normal arrangement, and then. You have the loop here. So the loop can either be a D loop or it can be an L loop. So the uh, alphabet here is either D or L. While for situs, it is uh, uh, solitus, it is S. For inverses, it is I. And for ambiguous, it is A. Coming to the great arteries, you have the, uh, uh, the uh, solitus, which is S here. And then you have the inverses, which is normal. So this is a little more uh, in terms of alphabets. And then you have the malposition where you have the B and the L, and then you have the ambiguous that is a malposition. So this is for the great arteries. So you have situs, the loop, and then you have the great arteries. Now, uh, let us look at some examples here. So you have the visceral atrial situs. So let us say that, for example, if it is situs solitus, so it is going to be S. And then it is going to be ventricular situs. So it is a D loop. So you're going to put it as D. And then the position of the great vessels, again, the solitus will be there. So for example, for a normal person, it will be SDS. So if it is uh, an inversion, the inverses, situs inverses, I will be replaced. So these are the alphabets and how it is uh, uh, put. And uh, these are the various other combinations in terms of situs inverses dextrocardia. You have the DTGA. Uh, and then the DTGA with situs inverses, and then you have the LTGA with situs solitus. So three important alphabets are looking primarily at the situs loop and again at the artery situs. Next, let us see how we can go about doing it, the sequential segmental analysis. So these are the uh, sort of broad headings which I will uh, take you through. So one is to look at the thoracoabdominal situs, and then there is the cardiac position, the orientation, then there is the atrial situs, and then you have to look at the connection. The first connection starts here. So this is the venoatrial connection. And then after that, the atrioventricular valves are look at it, and then the second connection comes from the ventricle into uh, with the atria, so the atrioventricular connection happens. And finally, looking at the ventricles itself, so the ventricular looping is seen, and then there is the infundibulum, and then the last connection is the ventricular arterial, and then finally the exit uh, of the great arteries, that is the arterial trunks and valve. So these are the steps which I will lead you, and this is how the echocardiography has to be done, looking at each and every step and how you should go about doing it. But importantly, before we do echo. It is uh, as clinicians, it is our duty to uh, make sure that we have enough uh, clinical background of the particular patient. So it may be our own patient, which we very well know, but if it is some other patient, it is uh, uh, important to spend a little time to just look at what exactly has uh, uh, the patient presented with. So the presentation is important, especially when you're looking in terms of, uh, 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 you know, whether it is synotic, asynotic, uh, based on the physical findings, one can sort of have some sort of a clarity even before putting the probe. And then the auscultation itself, one can look at the various murmurs, clicks, which can sort of strengthen your clinical uh, in, in, in initial impression before you start to do the echo. And then the investigations, not all investigations will be available, but at least the most basic, I think uh, the oxygen saturation should be the minimum. ECG chest X-ray depends. And uh, where, as and when it is there, I think one should also look at it very closely. And more importantly, uh, it is important that if you are going to uh, look at it for a monitoring purpose or if it's a serial echo, uh, it is important that you look at previous documents and reports to make sure that what has been the progression that has happened. Now, the diseases that may be associated uh, in the pediatric population, it can be congenital, 
it can be acquired. It can be due to arrhythmias. So this is another way of looking at it. So one can have a fair idea as to what exactly one is looking at it in terms of uh, each of these. So they acquired, for example, it could be a Kawasaki and arrhythmia uh, WPW syndrome or any of the blocks. So each of them have their own structural uh, changes, which uh, we can easily pick up based on the clinical background. So now let's come to the main uh, sort of uh, the menu itself, the echo. So how do we sort of go about doing echo? One is uh, the machine and then the equipment which is available at your disposal. So it's important that uh, we have these uh, uh, three uh, transducers. This is the best sort of a combination if you are going to do a comprehensive uh, population which, will be, which is available to you. So one is the neonatal, as you can see that the frequency is very high here because you don't need so much of penetration. So once you have very high frequencies, what happens is the imaging quality improves, the doctor improves, everything is perfect here. So in these uh, sort of uh, tiny uh, neonates, the imaging is, uh, uh, the image quality is really good. Next, you have the slightly older child, and then you can see that the a frequency here is slightly decreased, but still on the higher side. So you have a wide range here. So each vendor provides different ranges. So it's up to you as to what range you have, even when you're purchasing a machine. So depending on the population that you're going to see, you can look at the range it covers. So that means that you can sort of look at a wide spectrum of uh, these uh, uh, patients. Then it is always good to have an adult uh, transducer also because many a times so sometimes the imaging uh, uh, resolution may not sort of work out in the slightly older child and uh, this sort of really helps you to bypass. So uh, these are the three transducers which you should be uh, sort of looking at. And of course the curvilinear is so fetal echo which I'm not going to go through. Before starting an echo, it is important that we look at a few points. So I know that you know, most of us have different uh, sort of infrastructure, different backgrounds. So the way we look at it in terms of numbers, our busy schedule, the number of patients which we see, but ideally in an ideal setting, I think it is always good to have ECG gated images. That means you have to stick electrodes and connect the ECG as and when possible. So that'd be a very good hack. Next is always look to see if you can archive images. Archive images nowadays, you have these hard drives, external hard drives, which are easily available. And most of the machines are sort of uh, uh, friendly in terms of transfer of images. So make it a point to have uh, a good archival system. And if you want to go one step ahead, you can have the vendor-based uh, 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 software, which uh, archives images, raw data, that is even better. So always uh, sort of uh, look at how well you can archive images in terms of comparisons, in terms of presentations, in terms of interesting cases. There are so many reasons why you would like to do archive. Then when you're archiving images, you would like your images to be good. So one has to make sure that the protocol of image acquisition is uh, sort of according to uh, reasonable standards. So the ideal standards are going by the guidelines. So if you have the, uh, the mindset and if you have the background, one can go about doing it, but at least some basic uh, minimum per image acquisition protocol has to be there. That means uh, uh, minimum uh, views, minimum, minimum planes, and then the measurements. So that is just for monitoring and then some sort of a quality sort of check. Now, the other is how you want to do it. So one can do a sub and do it the more sort of uh, the, the, uh, the traditional way in terms of the pediatric one, or you can do it the adult way, go for the parasol long axis. So it doesn't really matter which way you sort of approach it, but what is important is the key line is that it has to be a segmental approach. So that segmental approach should always be looked at which, irrespective of which approach you do. But preferably in the pediatric population, it is always the sub the subcostal, which is preferred. Then uh, the other part is that apart from looking at the heart, there are there may be some other abnormalities in the lungs, in the abdomen, in the median sternum. So make it a point to see that uh, if you can sort of uh, get hold of uh, any sort of imaging abnormality, which might help you uh, to make your diagnosis better. And also keep this option of saline contrast to go many a times. Uh, we might end up in a, having a situation which we are, where we are not very sure. So uh, doing a saline contrast echo, which doesn't cost much and very easy to do, uh, that is the other uh, uh, point which is very important when you start before starting. The next sort of uh, uh, message is that I know that we're all very busy, but uh, as much as possible, avoid hurried echoes. And this is where, you know, in a pressured lab, in a very busy sort of OPD, we're always sort of uh, 
uh, you know, get into the situation where we are looking at other things. And in such situations, one error can be very costly. So when you are doing a pediatric echo, your mind has to be clear and you have to be comfortable as much as possible. And at the same time, even the patient has to be comfortable. The child has to be sort of comfortable, not crying. And uh, that will only sort of prolong. And then, you know, it, it doesn't uh, end up very well when uh, both the operator as well as the child are uncomfortable. So sufficient time has to be spent. And uh, uh, of course, when there's a child, you need to have some appropriate distractions in terms of toys, in terms of music, in terms of display. So you, you can have some very basic things which can sort of keep them uh, distracted. If that doesn't work, of course, sedation is there. And sedation is something which you should keep it as an, uh, an option. And uh, the usual due precautions have to be taken when sedation is given. But at the end of it, the key word is you have to have a lot of patience and you have to sort of make through, uh, make sure that you go through a very systematic approach. Now, when you start to uh, look at the, the heart itself, it has got its own long axis. So it has the body long axis and there is the heart long axis. So this is in an oblique fashion. So that means part of it is on the other side of the sternum. So that is one third is to the right of the sternum and two thirds is to the left of the sternum. And part of it is hidden by the sternum. And uh, that is the reason why we need to have multiple planes. So there are any number of planes which are in uh, literature. So I will just sort of briefly uh, uh, point out the important ones. So you have the, the, the three planes, which are the coronal plane, the sagittal and the transverse plane. And based on this, you have these views, the parasitic views, and then you have the subfossil and the apical, and then also the suprastrum. So that means you're making a very comprehensive approach. You're looking at it from the top, you're looking at it from below, you're looking at it from the anterior side, and then uh, uh, also uh, multiple cuts, multiple images, and multiple sweeps are done to make sure that you have a continuity of what the structure is all about. And it can start from the uh, most basic in terms of uh, the, uh, the connections in terms of the veins, and then you go all the way into the atria, and then finally uh, ventricles, and then you come out, uh, look at the great artery. So uh, these uh, multiple planes are very important. So uh, the transducer positions, again, uh, uh, most of you would be sort of uh, familiar with it. So this is just a review. So this is the parasitic window. So this is across the chest here. And then you have the apical windows, and then you have the subcostal. Uh, this is the one where in pediatric population, as we all know, provides great windows. And this is not a good window in the adult. And uh, this is something which we should take advantage of in the pediatric setting. And then finally, it is very, very important that we have to look at the suprasternal. So unlike in adults, sometimes we may not do it, but in the uh, pediatric population, it is a must to look at aortic uh, anomalies and other structures which are there at the, in the neck. And this again sort of tells you how the cross section is. So you have the longitudinal axis and then you have the transverse uh, section. So this base of the heart is where the key sort of imaging lies. So this is where most of the abnormalities are and this is where you have to spend a little more time. So the, uh, uh, the approach is to look at uh, as many sort of uh, uh, views as possible, as many cuts as possible, uh, looking at the base of the heart. Now, uh, this is the uh, one which is uh, the guidelines which has been recommended from the American Society of ECHO. So this is uh, called as a sweep wherein you start from the subxiphoid and then you start to do uh, something like an infro, inferior an angulation. And then you sort of in a stepwise fashion, you go through these uh, uh, structures. So for example, here you looked at the RV and then afterwards the next sweep, you look at the LV and then you get the outflow. And then afterwards, uh, when you do the next sweep, you get the LA and then you have the pulmonary veins. So this is the sequence where uh, uh, in the subxiphoid, uh, you uh, put the transducer like this, and then you go through the sequence of uh, being at the level of uh, this one, and then you sort of uh, keep going down, and then uh, further down, you get the uh, other structures. So this is the sweep, and this is the sub long axis views. Next is the sub short axis views. So again, here, a little bit of uh, leftward uh, angulation here, and then uh, you get a bit of a cross-sectional uh, 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 view of the, the structures. And then again, it's a sequential sweep here. So you can start the sweep from here, uh, as you can see from the base of the heart, and then you sort of gradually move it uh, further upwards, and then you come to the middle, and then you come closer to the uh, left ventricular apex at this point here. So this 
gives you at each level what the structures are in terms of its relationship. So for example, here you have the left atrium and then you have the SVC here, and then you have the aorta and then the pulmonary valve. And then lastly, so uh, a good sort of view in terms of how uh, the uh, heart looks like in terms of the uh, transverse uh, cutting. So what are the structures one would uh, to be looking of, looking for? It is a long list here. So you can see the uh, the veins, you have the uh, arteries here, and then the chambers, and then you have the coronary sinus, the pulmonary veins, the valves, uh, the ventricles, the septum. So a, a lot of uh, structures are uh, uh, visualized from this approach. And this is a very, very important uh, viewing uh, angle, uh, uh, viewing sort of area, viewing window. And uh, you can see the list of structures that one can make out. So it is important that you uh, keep this uh, in mind. Next is once you're done with the zephoid, uh, sub zephoid, you go to the apical view. So here again from the apical, it's more like a coronal cut here. So you get to see the uh, the shape of the uh, left uh, then the ventricles and then you are going to look at the uh, two uh, upper chambers the atria and then again it's a bit of a sweep here so you do a little bit of an anteroposterior go up and down starting from here and then you sort of uh, angulate it and uh, you keep going down here so this is the apical fourth chamber and of course in this view you can want to if you may want to look at two chamber three chamber it has limited value but uh, the fourth chamber uh, up and down views are important so in this, again, you can uh, see uh, sort of less number of uh, uh, abnormalities, but you do see a wide range, again, important structures, which uh, helps you to diagnose, to rule out. So these are the uh, various, uh, the chambers, the vessels here, and then the great arteries. So this is the one. Now, from the apical, we move on to the uh, anterior part of the chest. So this is the parasol long axis here. And in the parasol long axis, you have the conventional, the traditional parasol long axis here, and then a little tilt. So this is uh, what is called as the RV inflow view. And then uh, you get to see the tricuspid valve here. And then the outflow view, you get the pulmonary valve here. So this is again, a very simple sort of uh, tilt uh, back and forth. And uh, you get to see uh, both the right side as well as the left side, the inflow as well as the outflow. So this uh, uh, gives us uh, uh, additional information about uh, what you've already seen. And then in the same view, again, uh, what you've seen in the sub you're going to see it from the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, from the personal area. So this is the transverse part. So again, looking at the uh, LV functions pri primarily, looking at papillary muscles here, and then the valve, the mitral valve, and again at the base of the heart here. So this is again another very important crunch view here, looking at the aorta, the positioning of the pulmonary valve in terms of where they are, the normally related great arteries, and then the RVOT is here, and then uh, the valves, which uh, you have the pulmonary valve and the tricuspid valve, and then of course the interatrial septum. So the parasol views again provide a lot of uh, structural uh, assessment. So this again is something which is incremental, which you've already seen and you want to further strengthen your findings or to ruling in and ruling out. So this is helpful. Then finally, you're going to sort of end up uh, looking at the uh, uh, iota. This is the suprastrum. So it's not just the iota, you're looking at the SVC, you're looking at uh, the other, uh, uh, the branches of the aortic arch. So there are, um, uh, a lot of structures which you will be looking at it from the uh, suprasternum. So here you have the suprasternal short axis. Uh, primarily, we look at the long axis. We always start like this, and then a little bit of rotation uh, to 90 degrees, we get the short axis. And then this gives you additional information about the RP and then also the left atrium here, where you can get to see the pulmonary uh, veins here. So the suprasternal long axis, and then you have the suprasternal short axis. Then the less used, but you know, it, it is a difficult one, uh, uh, challenging one, but it, it is uh, sometimes whenever, whenever it is possible, it should be attempted. So to look at the high right personal, so you can look at both the, the connections of the RA, the SVC, and then the IVC. So this is something which is useful in terms of its uh, connections. And then uh, to look at the right pulmonary artery and then the right upper pulmonary vein also. So uh, these are again uh, the, uh, the, the kind of uh, structures which you see in the suprasternal view. So primarily you're looking at the vascular uh, uh, structures in the suprasternal and then the right parasternal also, apart from the vascular uh, structures, you also look at a little bit of chambers and the atrial septum here. Then a brief look at how we look at the traditional uh, 
uh, views in terms of the personal long axis. Again, uh, look at these various uh, normalities here that can be looked at in terms of uh, uh, the aortic root, in terms of valves, in terms of coronary sinus. And then again, the, uh, the, the similar sort of uh, views which I had shown earlier in the sweep uh, method. So this is the more conventional, this is the more traditional adult sort of approach, uh, but you, you can more or less see the same structures, but in a different way. So it is uh, an, it's an option that is available uh, for those who, who are not uh, familiar with the sweep. And then again, the apical views, uh, and then there is the subcostal, uh, which uh, is uh, the, the same as which I told earlier, but this is more the adult way. So personal is again, similar to that. Now, uh, when you put everything together, uh, so this is uh, primarily a focus on uh, uh, the basics of ECHO. So I cannot really sort of talk about the other advancements which are, uh, have taken place. So when you look at the top level of images, this is what you will be starting off and this is what you'll be doing. So looking at the M mode, looking at 2D, and then there is color, and then you have the uh, spectral Doppler. So this is the conventional echo. Now we have the uh, advanced echo, this is tissue Doppler, this is strain over here, and then the 3D. So in view of uh, the inappropriate uh, sort of uh, uh, Mess of this uh, uh, advanced echo, which doesn't really belong to this uh, topic here, which uh, uh, probably I'll take it up uh, some other time. Uh, but uh, the uh, echo of present day doesn't just uh, sort of confine yourself, you know, you cannot confine yourself to this. So it is very important that as and when possible, that when advanced echo facilities are available, that you should be sort of uh, training yourself into this and incorporating, integrating the advanced echo uh, applications and combining and to make your diagnosis and approach better. So let's start with the first of the uh, the, the big ones, the thoracoabdominal site. So how do we start looking at the situs itself? So when we use the word situs, it means uh, the, the arrangement of position of the uh, viscera. So in terms of uh, uh, which side the liver is, which side the spleen is, that, that means like uh, how, how is it lateralized? So solitus, which I mentioned earlier. So when we use the word solitus, that means it is the usual site or is it the, no, or the normal uh, as we call it. So whenever we say situs solitus, that means it is normal. Inverses is the opposite or the reverse. So it's a mirror image. So that means everything gets uh, a reverse. So they go in the opposite direction. So that means you have the situs inverses where even the thoracic and the abdominal organs uh, are uh, uh, positioned on the opposite side. Then you have this term ambiguous. We, we, are, in, we are not sure. So it is neither uh, solitus nor is it inverses. So it is uncertain, undetermined. And the word, uh, this is a typical word which is used even in the, uh, for a general purpose also, ambiguous, which we're, we're not very sure. So this is situs ambiguous. So that means uh, uh, there is no lateralization of uh, uh, these, uh, the, uh, the organs which uh, are uh, mentioned here. So when we find a situation like this, we call it as situs ambiguous. So each of them have alphabets, which I mentioned earlier. So you have S, I, and A. So this is an example of how one can look at situs solitus. So this is the subcostal, which I'll show in the next image. So you have the IVC here and then the iota here. And uh, when you look at the, uh, the solitus of the, the thoracoabdominal, uh, the viscera itself, so you have the right lung, it's a trilobed lung here, and then you have the bilobed lung. You have a short bronchus, you have a longer bronchus, and then you have the heart, the apex facing the left side, liver on the right side, and then you have the stomach on the left side, and then the spleen here. So this is a typical normal person situs, solids. Inverses, everything gets uh, more to the other side. So here you can see that the IVC comes this side, the aorta goes to the other side, and then the uh, right lung comes this side, the left lung goes on to the other side, the apex is face, uh, facing the other side, the liver comes on this side, and then the stomach goes to the other side. And uh, for this, the chest X-ray is the best one to look at the funnel gas shadow, and then the spleen goes to the right side. Now, uh, when uh, we are doing echo, the best is uh, as uh, we had uh, uh, sort of uh, looked at it earlier. So in terms of uh, sub -zephoid. so this is how it is going to be seen. So you have this bright sort of color, which is seen here. So this is the pulsatile uh, iota here. And then this is the blue continuous flow, which is the IVC. So you can see that this is to the right and this is to the left here. And how do we differentiate apart from the color? Uh, of course, we know that the color can be sometimes be deceiving. So what we do is we you just put a pulse over there 
uh, pulse Doppler and you get this pulsatile flow. So when it comes in a pulsatile fashion, that means we know immediately that it is an artery which we are uh, uh, sampling. So similarly, if you pulse again with the pulse Doppler, you will see more of a continuous uh, uh, wave. So this can be downwards also, depending on the, uh, how you sort of uh, see it. So this is a positive behavior. It can be a negative wave also. But what is important is that it is not pulsatile, it is continuous. So this tells you that this is a venous one, that it, this is IVC. So uh, if one looks at it this way, then it is cytosolitis. And of course, you're going to look at the liver here. So the liver, as you see, is very sort of very prominently displayed here. So this tells you that it, this is on the right side. And if you maneuver a little bit, you can see the uh, spleen also on this side. So this sort of tells you uh, that this is cytosolitis. So now let us look at how we can go a little beyond. So this is a cytosolitis here. You have the uh, uh, right bronchus, you have the left bronchus here, and then you have the uh, trilobed right uh, uh, lung, and then the bilobed uh, left lung here, and then you have the liver here, and again, this is uh, something like uh, what you would see even on a CT also, so you can see that the same thing uh, put in a different sort of a context, and uh, uh, a cut section, a transfer section, so it tells you that this is cytosolitis. And once it is inverted, you get something like this. Everything goes to the opposite side. Next is what is called as the ambiguous. So in ambiguous, what is also called as visceral hydrotaxy, where we are not very sure what is happening. It's a broad arrangement where it is ambiguous. So here it can be an isomerism. So isomerism can be a right-sided structure, which is dominating, or a left uh, structure, which is... Uh, Dominating. So you can have left isomerism or you can have right isomerism. So that means in left isomerism, it will be the left uh, uh, appendage, it will be the left lung, which will be on both the sides, liver will be uh, uh, both the sides, and then you have the spleen also multiple uh, polysplenia will be there. If it is right, you will see a spleenia, and then you'll see a, a trilobed uh, right lung. So th this is typically how the isomerism works. So this is all part of the situs uh, uh, approach. So once we have established the situs, uh, whether it is uh, solitus, inverses, or ambiguous, then we look at the cardiac position. So what is exactly the cardiac position? So now, uh, is the uh, uh, heart on the left side? Is it on the right side? So is it levocardia? Is it dextrocardia? Or is it in the middle, mesocardia? So this is the cardiac orientation. So when the apex is directed to the left of midline, levocardia, to the right, it is uh, mesocardia, and um, dextrocardia is uh, to the right, sorry, and then mesocardia is in the midline. Now, there are these other words which we use. So again, the, this is uh, sometimes can be very confusing. So you can have a dextro position when it's just pushed. So that means if, for example, if there's a left congenital diaph diaphragmatic hernia, so the cardia is pushed to the uh, right side, or you can have a dextro version wherein you can have an AV discordance, but uh, there is cytosolitis. And so these two are uh, slightly different terminologies uh, for when we are talking in terms of uh, uh, dextrocardia and uh, levocardia. Now, once you have uh, sort of established uh, the uh, position of the heart, the orientation of the heart, now we have to start looking at the atria. Now, how is the atria in terms of its morphology? So we have to have a clear idea of how the atria uh, anatomically looks like. So uh, these are the differentiating factors and uh, the right atrium and the left atrium, especially when we look at the appendage. So the right atrial appendage is generally bigger, it is more broad based, while the left atrium is more narrow, it is finger like. And then the right atrium has these connections. So uh, generally the IVC also to some extent can be used as a, some sort of a marker that it is associated with right atrium, but not, not all the time, but it is the appendage which is a very, very important uh, component as to identify the morphological right atrium. Then you have these other features. You have the Custa terminalis, which in a routine sort of manner, you can sort of use it. Uh, uh, a broad sort of uh, uh, tissue ledge, which is seen close to the uh, SVC. And in terms of tabaculations, they are less tabaculated when you compare it to the right atrium. Uh, this is the left side. And then uh, the left side also has the pulmonary veins. So these are the differentiating factors which we should be aware. So we are when we look at the atria, so these are the 
uh, uh, sort of uh, parameters which we say uh, that uh, this is right atrium because of these uh, findings which I see, and this is left atrium, this is uh, because of uh, uh, these uh, parameters. More importantly, the appendage is the most important one which identifies. So as you can see here, this is a sub -zifoid. And uh, this is the right atrial appendage here. So this is quite broad based. Uh, uh, it, it, you, you have to search for it a little bit, but uh, this is how uh, the right atrial appendage looks like. And then the left atrial appendage, as you can see, are typically finger-like. It is more narrow here compared to this, which is a little more broad. So when you have uh, uh, the isomerism, so that means bilateral right atria. When you have left isomerism, you have bilateral left atria. So that means you have features of left atria on both the sides. So that tells you you're dealing with some sort of isomerism. But the main message here is how to look at the atrial appendages. So after we sort of identify the atria now, so next we move on to the veno-atrial connection. So uh, what, what is this veno-atrial connection? So here we look at the, uh, the connection of the vessels which connect to the uh, atria. So one is looking at the SVC. So the right SVC uh, is always there. Uh, and in some patients, you can also get the left SVC, which is also called as the bilateral SVC. So for this, the suprasternal uh, or the other uh, various views, the sub can be helpful. So one has to be careful here. You can have the left in nominate, you can have an anomalous vein over there, or even a left SVC can sometimes confuse you. So this is uh, uh, something which you should be aware of. But the main thing is that you're looking at the connections here going into the atria. And also the other connection is the IVC. So here in the IVC, it's important that you identify the hepatic vein. So the, uh, the presence of hepatic vein sort of tells you that it is, there is no abnormality of the IVC that it is connecting to the right atrium. The moment you don't see the hepatic vein, that means you have to start looking for some abnormality. Is there any interrupted IVC? So this uh, uh, IVC plethora is very important when you look at it. Then uh, coming to the uh, left atrium. So the left HM, uh, you have to identify in terms of its veins. So you have these four pulmonary veins. So these four pulmonary veins, uh, um, many a times we are sort of satisfied with just three. So getting all the four pulmonary veins can be difficult, but uh, it is uh, possible uh, if in certain views. So importantly, as you can see here, uh, just identify the flow, a flow which is going in an oblique fashion this way. This is the right superior uh, pulmonary vein. And uh, this is sometimes, uh, it's see more anteriorly angulated. That means your probe is facing upwards. Uh, if you see a flow which is going parallel to the septum, that means that this is right lower pulmonary vein. So those are the two sort of uh, uh, flows which tells you. So the oblique one is the right upper, and then the one which is parallel to the septum is the right lower. Then the one which is coming close to the uh, left atrial appendage, the left atrial appendage comes here. So this flow is the left superior pulmonary vein, and uh, uh, this is the most uh, difficult one, the left lower pulmonary vein. Uh, so this is from this uh, uh, view of the fourth chamber in the uh, apical view. So there's something called the cramps view. So going a little higher up uh, in terms of the suprasternal. So rotating it and getting a, a short axis. So at this point, you can get to see all the four uh, veins. So this is a, a sort of mimics how a crab looks like with its uh, uh, four extensions. So you have the left, the left upper pulmonary vein here, the left lower here, and the right upper here. And then you have the right lower pulmonary vein. And this is with color. So the crabs view, the uh, suprasternal or the high uh, parasternal, can get you this view. So that is for the left atrium. So at the same time, it's important to look at the ASD also. So if the, uh, how, how is the interatrial septum? So interatrial septum in terms of the, uh, the uh, uh, whether it's ostium secundum or the ostium primum, different types of ASD. So this is a, a combined sort of approach here when we are looking at, at this level. And uh, uh, one should also not forget to look at the corneal sinus also. So more than many a times you'll see the corneal sinus dilated. So we should have a, a good idea of uh, how the anatomy is. So the corneal sinus is a small sort of eclusent area which drains into the right atrium. So this is again from a modified uh, 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 apical view. And uh, this again, you can see that it is very thin here. Moment it gets dilated because of various abnormalities, it becomes very, very prominent. And it is posterior. So uh, the coronary sinus opens into the right atrium. And this is one such view where you can get an easy sort of look at it. Now, 
from moving from the atrial and moving from the uh, venous level. So let's come down further from the base of the heart. We are moving to the level of the atroventricular valves here. So we have to have uh, an idea of how the atroventricular valves look like in, in terms of how they go with the respective uh, ventricles. So tricuspid valve always goes with the RV, mitral valve always goes with the LV. So with the tricuspid valve, you have the septum caudal attachment. So this is what separates it from the mitral valve. So there is a, a leaflet, septal leaflet, and there is a caudal attachment to the septum. And then uh, it is more apically displaced. And of course, it has got three leaflets. And uh, if it is possible, one can look at multiple spawn papillaries. So this is uh, how one can differentiate it. Mitral valve on the other side, there is no uh, septal leaflet here, only two leaflets. And uh, there are two large papillary muscles. So uh, it's important that you identify which AV valve it is. And uh, this sort of tells you what is the chamber you're looking at because the valve goes with the chamber. So uh, this is the point where you can see that this is a four chamber. So this is the septal leaflet here, which is more apically displaced. And this is the anterior leaflet of the uh, mitral valve. And uh, this is at a lower level. So in between these two, you can get to see this uh, small sort of uh, uh, distance here. So this distance again has to be uh, sort of utilized when you're looking at Epstein's. So uh, uh, this is again, there's a cutoff of around eight millimeters per body squared. So anything more than that tells you that it is Epstein. So this is uh, an area where you can see if there's offsetting, so you can look at uh, other abnormalities here. It's also important that you look at the patency of the valves, whether it is a single valve, whether it's a common valve when you call in a AVSD, or is there an atritic uh, uh, abnormality? So these are the uh, various uh, uh, structural abnormalities you'll be looking at. Now, uh, let's look at the atrioventricular connections in terms of how does it connect. So normally when we use the word concordant, that means the right atrium connects to the RV and the left atrium connects to the LV. When we use the word discordant, that means RA connects to LV and the LA connects to RV. Or uh, if it is not discordant, is it uh, an atrium uh, to one ventricle? Is it uh, you know, the double uh, uh, inlet or a single outlet. So, uh, so these are the various sort of uh, uh, abnormalities which can be looked at at this level. And uh, uh, this again sort of uh, gives you an idea as to this part, especially which I'm focusing here. So this is the atrioventricular septum. So this is where the Gerbode defect, you have the three different types of Gerbode defects. The true defect is always uh, the the one which is less commonly seen, but which is the one which is congenital. So this comes at a very, it's a very narrow window here. And this is where you should be focusing upon. Uh, now, just to look at the uh, various sort of variations. So again, these are pathologies, which is not really the focus of this, but just an example of how one can look at different types of abnormal various atrioventricular connections. So you, this is the concordant uh, AV connection, and then you have the discordant AV connection, and then you have a common AV valve, and then you have an atritic valve here, and uh, another atritic valve, and then you have a double inlet uh, ventricle. So these are the examples of abnormal atrioventricular connections. Next is looking at looping. So this is another very, very important uh, part of uh, understanding of uh, the segmental uh, analysis, looking at the looping. So when we talk in terms of uh, looping, uh, if you have to go back to your embryology, uh, it, uh, we know that the heart starts uh, as islands and then there are two tubes and then it combines and forms one linear tube. And the top end of the linear tube is the truncus and then you have the bulbus and then you have the uh, primitive ventricle, and then you have the atria here, and then there is the sinus venosus, and then the sinus venosus, you have the uh, horns of the uh, venosus here, and then the white line veins come here. So a D loop is something which you should understand. So a D loop is something in a normal development, the heart tube moves to the right. Uh, that means the inflow portion of the morphologic RV lies to the right of the morphologic LV. So this is a D loop. So the inflow of the morphologic RV lies to the right of the morphologic LV. Now the L loop is abnormal. So here the heart tube uh, during its development bends to the left. And in this, the inflow portion of the RV lies to the left of the morphological LV. So this is the looping part of it. And uh, uh, this is how the looping takes place. So you have the, the bulbus, you have the uh, atria, and then you have the sinus venosus here. 
and then the septation starts to take place at this point here and then it uh, divides itself into the primitive uh, ventricles and then the uh, 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 the, the the septation of the atria also takes place so this is typical looping where it goes for a rightward uh, bend and uh, this is normal so when it goes the other way then it is l loop and if it goes in a d loop this is how you normally see it now uh, there are ways of trying to sort of make it easy for us. So there are uh, enough sort of examples. So this is one wherein if you're looking at a right-handed topology, your thumb is in the uh, uh, inflow here, that is on the right side. And uh, if you're placing your hand uh, in uh, with uh, the thumb going into the, uh, the uh, left inflow, that means it is a left-handed topology. So this sort of uh, tells you that it is uh, 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 which way the looping has taken place. So the right-handed topology and then the left-handed topology. And then in here, uh, apart from uh, looking at the looping, so one can uh, look at the ventricle itself in terms of uh, uh, the various abnormalities and also to look at the septation in terms of the ventricular uh, septum and then any abnormalities uh, related to this. And uh, lastly, to look at the chambers itself. So in, uh, we are still at the chamber level. So how an LV looks uh, and how an RV looks. LV has a, a more smoother surface. It is much thicker. There is no moderator band and it has got this mitral aortic continuity and it has less tabaculations. Uh, RV on the other hand is more crescentic shaped, large tabaculations. It has an inlet, apical and outlet. And then the moderator band, very, very important feature. And then there is uh, this uh, 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 tricuspid valve, uh, which is there. Then uh, the next level is to look at ventricular arterial. So now we are sort of moving from the chambers. We are now moving towards the uh, arterial level, the ventricle and the arterial level. So how does one identify aorta? Aorta gives rise to the coronary arteries and it has its arch vessels. The pulmonary artery, on the other hand, bifurcates into two, but does not give rise to any vessels. So uh, the question that has to be asked is when uh, you're looking at, you come down to this level is, uh, is each ventricle uh, having one arterial trunk? So if it is there, then is it concordant or is it discordant? If it is not there, is it double outlet or is there any atresia? So this is how the stepwise examination tells you and you try to sort of rule in and rule out. For example, here you have the outlet here and then you know that this is uh, uh, coming from the left ventricle. Let's assume that this is the normal one, the left ventricle, the uh, moderator band is not there and the mitral valve is there. So that means this is the normal uh, atrio, uh, ventricular arterial uh, concordance is there. Now, when you look at the pulmonary artery, so there is a bifurcation which happens here. So this tells you that this is a pulmonary artery. So you can look at it from whichever way you want it. So the main thing is importantly, if you are looking at the, uh, the pulmonary trunk, the bifurcation is important. So once you identify the bifurcation, once you see it, once you spot it, you know clearly that this is a PA. And then for the uh, aorta, it is the aortic arch and its branches and the coronary arteries, which tells you that it is aorta. So concordance, discordance, yeah, aorta to LV is concordance, pulmonary artery to RV is concordance, discordant is aorta to RV and pulmonary artery to LV. So you can have this uh, double outlet. And uh, if there is an arterial override, that means 50% of, uh, of an artery overrides a ventricle, it is said to be uh, committed to it. So if it is shared equally, you say that it's 50%. If it is more than that, then it will say it is, this uh, artery is uh, committed to uh, such and such a ventricle. So the other important abnormality uh, is not really part of it, but still, again, I th thought it would be sort of important to just to highlight this. So when we talk about overriding and straddling, so sometimes the terminologies get mixed up here. So it's important that when you look at straddling, that means that there is a valve which is there, which is uh, uh, coming from the, the um, uh, one ventricle where it is supposed to come from, but it is also getting an attachment going to the contralateral ventricle. So that means if the mitral is coming from the left ventricle, but part of the cord A uh, is getting attached to the right side, that means we say it is, that's an example. So that means we say it is straddling. So a cordae or a papillary muscle of the valve attaching to the contralateral ventricle is straddling. Now, uh, looking at the aorta, so the normal position of the aorta, uh, what we always say is that aorta is posterior and to the right, 
and uh, when we say it is inverses, so it is posterior and to the left. And then you have these various other combinations, a lot of combinations here, but it's important that when you say it is normal, it is uh, iota is posterior and it is to the right. And uh, these are the abnormal ventricular arterial connections. So you have a discordant uh, V connection. So this is uh, uh, TGA, this is uh, corrected TGA, and then you have a DORV here. And then there's a common uh, arterial trunk. And then you have a, a pulmonary atresia, which is there. And here you have an aortic atresia. So these are sort of various other abnormalities which you can identify at this level. So now uh, coming to the last few slides. So this is now to look at the arterial trunks and the semilunar valves. So here again, uh, uh, one can uh, also look at the coronary arteries. So the coronary arteries uh, uh, coming from uh, this uh, normally at uh, this level uh, from the left coronary sinus, you have the right coronary sinus. Uh, so you can see the right coronary artery here and then the left coronary artery. Uh, yeah, depending on that, uh, we say that uh, uh, this is um, the uh, aortic uh, root. But you can also have a lot of coronary anomalies. So that also one should be aware in terms of position, in terms of location, in terms of its termination. So there are various other coronary anomalies, but this is the uh, level at which one can uh, try to identify the coronary arteries and uh, how it looks like. And uh, if it is there, if it is normal, great. If not, one goes beyond it and starts looking for abnormalities. Then looking at the aortic arch itself, a left aortic arch, or is it a right aortic arch? So the left aortic arch is traditionally where you sort of uh, look at your long axis. And when you have a right aortic arch, you turn it, uh, uh, sort of go, go in the opposite direction. And uh, the first sort of branch usually comes from the left side as the nominate, and that sort of tells you that is the right aortic arch. But importantly, when we look at the uh, aortic arch, we have to see these three vessels. So you have the first one, the uh, brachiocephalic, and then you have the carotid, and then the subclavian. So uh, most of the times you should be able to see three red flows going. So, and then uh, if there are any anomalies, uh, uh, you can look at it. And then of course the uh, sidedness, whether it is right or left, uh, it is important that you look at this level. So uh, this again is how to look at the short axis and the long axis, so uh, the, the, uh, and the relationship of the arteries. Now, the last part of it, uh, just before I'm sort of running out of time now, so I'll sort of hurry up a little bit. So in terms of uh, use of the word conus, when we say conus, that means we are looking at it from the outside. When we say infundibulum, when we say it is from the inside. So this is that part uh, which is there uh, between the great vessel and the chamber. So the absence of the subfalma uh, uh, in the uh, on the right side uh, is uh, uh, abno abno abnormal, while on the uh, left side, if it is uh, present, it is uh, uh, abnormal. So this is again something which we should be aware in terms of conus. Now, uh, once you have finished all these levels, so then it's important that you look at the measurements. So the measurements we go through the various ones, the chambers in terms of what it is, and then also to look at the function and uh, look at pressures also in terms of the RA pressure, the, uh, the pulmonary artery pressure. Now here we have to look at the Z-score. So the Z-score has to be applied. So you have a lot of Z-calculators, you have these uh, nomograms, algorithms, which are there. You can either stick it in onto your machine or there, or you can have it online as a calculator. So this sort of tells you as to what is the particular measurement for that particular age. And it's very important in the, in the, in the child because as they keep growing, the, the normal range keeps changing. And uh, uh, the Z-score sort of uh, gives you a good sort of an idea as to where it is. So this is just a standard deviation above or below a size of a particular age-specific uh, population mean. And uh, uh, so this is an excellent means of charting serial measurements in uh, the pediatric practice. So this is just an example of how one can look at z score. So this is taken from an online calculator. So all you have to do is uh, uh, put in the height, weight, and then the, the gender, and then the age. And then you can start to in, put in your input here. And this is the output. So the calculator automatically sort of gives you the uh, score. And then it tells you what is the range here. And then lastly, the spectral doppers uh, are a very basic uh, uh, sort of measurement, which has to be incorporated into your report. So looking at the uh, outflow doppler, the left ventricular outflow, the right ventricular outflow, and then the mitral inflow and the functions, both the right and left functions. So this is again, part of uh, the complete study. 
Now, uh, as you start to report now, so minimum sort of reporting is, uh, uh, as we all know, like there are some identifiers for every record. So this is a standard. Uh, beyond it, uh, you can have your various sort of ways of uh, sort of going about it. So you can have the finding section. So this is where it sort of changes. So you can put it in a very sort of a segmental systematic way so that whatever you have studied sort of goes into the report. So that sort of uh, tells you uh, or whether you have uh, sort of uh, gone ahead, uh, about it in a very systematic fashion. So you can have your own sort of uh, report layout, but this is just a broad sort of uh, uh, structure which tells you how you can go about doing it. So to conclude, one should have a sequential segmental approach. So looking at the situs, thoracic abdominal situs, looking at the cardiac position, looking at the atrial situs, the atrio, uh, the atrovenous uh, connections, the ventricular looping, the atroventricular connection, the ventricular arterial connection, and then of course the relationship between the great arteries, the conus, the infundibulum, and then the description of uh, any associated malformations. So uh, sort of try to summarize a lot of important points. So I think I will stop at this point and I'll take the questions. Thank you very much for your kind patience. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shruti Sir, for an outstanding, vivid, concise, and gem of a lecture on pediatric echo. Now, the time for uh, question and answer session due to time limit. Uh, please shoot your questions, few questions on the second. Uh, Dr. I'm not seeing any question in the chat box. Uh, is there any question, Professor Jahid or Professor Salam? Uh, thank you very much, Madam. Uh, it is an wonderful session. Thank you for this initiative, the learning for the particular for the junior as well as for the authorities. And uh, it was a well illustrated, simplified lecture from Dr. Shatish Babu. And I think all the participants of this webinar uh, really enjoyed these big and vast topics. He has simplified and well illustrated, uh, although cool and basic. And uh, for the- Your voice is not clear, Dr. Salam. Not clear? We are not listening. Okay, can you can you hear me? Yeah, now now little bit clear. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a uh, the connection problem. Uh, actually, I like to congratulate uh, Dr. Shatish uh, Gobind for his uh, excellent delivery on a uh, very day-to-day uh, -day practice uh, of uh, pediatric echo for pediatric cardiologist in a very simplified way. He has illustrated and um, uh, nicely described, I should say, because it is a very vast topic. Within one hour, if you want to conclude, you cannot uh, include all the things. There are so many uh, um, uh, structure and so many abnormalities in pediatric practice we encounter, we cannot um, uh, include all the things. But he has nicely uh, uh, described all the basic things and the approach, how, uh, how a uh, um, echocardiograph by Shuk uh, uh, write the uh, uh, food approach and finally give the report. And anything or you can give your comment? Open con and Amiral, sir, please uh, mute yourself. Uh, yes, Professor Jahim. 
Yeah, actually, uh, you asked me a comment. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Shotish Govind, for giving a brilliant presentation. Actually, who we are, who, who we are the senior person. All of you know how to uh, do a PDTK. It definitely it should be started uh, with a segmental approach. And he has given a very illustrated, brilliant presentation. I think who are the beginner or have been the early stage of. A, doing echocardiography, uh, all of the participants who are present today will, uh, will be much benefited with them. Uh, I will not ask any question because it is all known to me. I'll just will, uh, express my thanks and gratitude to Dr. Shokhi Babin uh, for to give such a brilliant presentation. Thanks uh, for Professor Nuna Patma for arranging uh, such a uh, lecture, online lecture for the for the pediatric cardiologist as well as for the students. Thanks. Thank you, Zahid Bhai. Uh, actually, this uh, online lecture is for the fellows and for the students, uh, not for the senior people, but uh, senior people we attend just to actually, just to learn because learning has no end. Even yeah, yeah. though we are very senior, we are doing the eco for a long time. But even then, every day I learn something new. So yeah. learning has no end. Yeah, and yeah. whenever we attend a lecture, definitely we learn something new. Uh, so is today. So Dr. Uh, Shatish C. Govin, congratulations. And uh, this is actually a very nice lecture for the newcomer and for the new students, those who are starting echocardiography because they should learn the sequential approach. They should not do the echo haphazardly. Uh, there will be more chance of mistake if they do something in a haphazard way and uh, the report will be uh, uh, actually not acceptable to the people. So from the very beginning of the career, they should try to gain confidence from the people, from the fellow colleagues, from the fear uh, by doing a good echocardiography following sequential approach. If they follow the sequential approach, definitely there will be very little chance of mistake. So I wish our student, they have learned a lot today from you. Uh, and we are doing these lectures uh, in sequential manner. So they have only already learned about the terminologies in some other lecture. And today this lecture, is little bit of repetition for them. So this has helped them to learn more and to keep lecture will help them uh, to actually recapitulate the previous lecture and to keep them in their memory uh, forever. So thank you very much for taking this lecture and thanks a lot from my side again. Handing over to Cornel Ashford. It's a real pleasure, Dr. Fatima. I fully agree with you. I think you summarized it wonderfully. Learning has no end. And yeah. every time, you know, we read, there's always something yeah. new we learn in spite of reading it again and again. So yes, yes. Very nice. Yes. Uh, everybody true. is a different. So we can learn, uh, we can learn from everybody. Thank you. We teach our knowledge and as well as yeah. practical practice. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, sir and madam. And um, a few questions uh, is arising in the chat box. If one is which view is the most appropriate for diagnosis of juxtaposition of atrial appendage? The atrial appendage, again, uh, uh, we'll have to go by the uh, subzephoid. So that would be the uh, subzephoid view would be the uh, good one, looking at the right atrial appendage. Another question is sometimes we see dual flow in uh, main, uh, NPA during uh, personal shock, short exit other than PDA, how we differentiate between AP window, MAPCA, coronary fistula? The uh, flow is you have to you utilize the uh, pulsing, you utilize the pulse Doppler. And then again, there is an option which is available on the machines that is called as the color compare or the simultaneous wherein you can try to compare the flow with the structure, uh, the 2D structure on one side and the color on the other side. And then uh, uh, 
uh, sometimes when you're unable to uh, find out which part of the flow it is, you know, you can always utilize the ECG also to see whether uh, it is a continuous flow, systolic, uh, predominant or diastolic. So the ECG is helpful. So based on this, uh, one can uh, I try to identify whether it is uh, uh, you know, what sort of flow it is in terms of the AP window or any other flow or a PD. So uh, com combining uh, uh, spectral Doppler combining the color compare and uh, using the ECG and looking at the timing of the flows that uh, can help you to identify. Okay, so another question is, uh, what are the points uh, uh, during eco views you should consider of visibility of VSD to aorta in DRV with DML cost aorta? Uh, could you please uh, repeat that question? I would tie her. Okay, rootability of VSD to aorta. What are the points we should consider during our echoes uh, to say that the VSD is rootable uh, to the aorta in URV DML cost? Rotability, rotability of VSD to aorta. Yeah, the, this again, the view would be the sweep, which uh, you can look at it from the subzephoid and also from the personal long axis. So, uh, the, the, those are the views I would suggest. Yes, sir. I think there is no more question. Uh, our thanks and gratitude to you, sir, for taking all the pain and spending your valuable time for us. And our respected panelists, distinguished participants, thank you once again for participating and making this session lively. Now the announcement for the next class. It will be taken by Dr. Gina Makija. Uh, she will talk on fluid and electrolyte management in post-operative patients after cardiac surgery. Hope to see you in the next week. Till then, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shakish, again Real for pleasure. your outstanding lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.